My walks take me to every corner of Britain as I seek out history embedded in the landscape. In this country, you're never very far from mysterious ruins or the shadow of unwelcome visitors. So from romantic moors to majestic peaks, I'm really enjoying some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me through a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time I'm in the Scottish Highlands, where tourists flock for tartan traditions and spectacular scenery. But until the 19th century, outsiders like me would have avoided this area, a mysterious and dangerous land populated by barbarians in kilts. I want to discover how all that changed, thanks to an unpopular German prince and his besotted queen. The Cairngorms National Park is Britain's largest parkland. Ancient native forests, vast lochs, and our highest mountain range, all stretching across 1,700 square miles of the highlands. Pitlochry is the southern gateway to the region, and its high streets scream Scotland from every window. There's kilts and plaids and bagpipes and cute little tea rooms. No wonder the tourists flock here, but it is McDisneyland. Where do these cliches come from? Is this really Scottish or all just for the tourists? At a time when Britain's 300-year union and Scotland's identity are being debated and reshaped, I want to explore the creation of the world-famous Scottish brand. Look at all those turrets and crenellations. It does a pretty good impersonation of a castle, doesn't it? But do you think it's seen many marauding Scots and bits of flying shrapnel? No. Not bad for a hotel, though. Pitlochry is part of the wholesale 19th century rebranding which brought tourists flooding to the highlands. It's a transformation that owes a surprising debt to the couple at the centre of my four-day walk. Prince Albert and Queen Victoria. I'll be crossing three giant sporting estates the royal pair knew well. Day one takes me through the Killiecrankie Pass, a battlefield of rebellious pre-Victorian Scotland. Then it's on to an unprecedented royal visit at Blair Castle. Day two is an epic hike over the Cairngorms. I'll discover how brutal clearances made this one of the emptiest landscapes in Europe and a playground for the rich. Into Royal D side, I get a taste for the Highland Games at Braemar, before reaching the Tartan Palace Albert built for his queen at Balmoral. On my final day, I'll explore the murky waters of Loch Mick and the legacy this couple's passion has left in the landscape. I'm setting off north of Pitlochry, along the banks of the River Garry, through the Killiecrankie Pass. I'm already in the footsteps of Albert and Victoria. On the 11th of September 1844, they disembarked the royal yacht at Dundee and travelled through here on their first ever visit to the Highlands. They'd had a busy four years of marriage. 25-year-old Victoria had given birth to her fourth child only a month before. She'd also survived three assassination attempts. Albert demanded she take a holiday. But coming here was an extraordinary move, because no British monarch had ever travelled this far north. In fact, less than a century earlier, the British state was still at war with the Highlands, a bloody conflict that lasted over 50 years and started right here with the very first Jacobite uprising. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. To find out what happened here at Killiecrankie, I've asked historian Alistair Moffat to join me on the old military road through the pass. 
This was a very important route because this took you from the lowlands, lowland pressure, into the highlands. I mean, we're crossing Britain's last frontier, really. People spoke Scots, English. Behind us, in front of us, they spoke Gaelic. So was this Jacobite country? Oh, yes. I mean, this was clan country. The Jacobites were led by Viscount Dundee, known as Bonnie Dundee. You had to be Bonnie <laughs> to be a Jacobite leader. Bonnie Dundee was the first man to raise an army against the British government in support of the ousted Catholic king, James VII. On the 27th of July, 1689, Dundee's Highlanders massed just north of this pass. This was an absolutely strategic flashpoint. This was the way into the Highlands, but it was also dangerously the way out. 5,000 highly organised government troops, twice the Highlanders' numbers, marched through the narrow pass. Bonnie Dundee's men were ready for them. Raising their broadswords, they charged, cutting right through the terrified British army. We're standing above uh, the soldier's leap where Donald McBain, who is a fleeing government soldier, he's running for his life and he's running down here and he's been pursued by half a dozen hairy arsed Highlanders. <laughs> I tell you, he gets to the River Gary here and he jumps it. He jumps clear across. He sets a world record for the long <laughs> jump. And I tell you, if it was me, I'd set one as well. The Highlanders won a stunning victory at Killycranky and an indelible reputation as barbarous warriors, helped perhaps by their unique dress sense. I'm almost embarrassed to ask you this question. Yeah. Well, I am embarrassed, because it's the real <laughs> callow Englishman's question. Did they really wear kilts on the battlefield? Yes, they did, but not as you and I would know it. Um, they wore what was called the big kilt, which essentially was just a huge plaid uh, secured by a belt, and they pulled it around their middle, and of course, I have one here. Of course you do. I have one here. Now, this is basically a huge rug. That's it's essentially what it is. It's and if massive. you chuck it out, you'll see it is absolutely enormous. How the heck would you fight in this? Well, you didn't. I mean, basically, they unbuckled their belts and they threw these away and they charged in their sarks or their shirts. They didn't wear pants? Uh, no. No, no. Such a thing was never known in the Highlands. It really was that. Oh, yeah. Whoa. yeah, exactly. That's right. You know, show your backside to the enemy, then turn around and give them what for. I'm not surprised the Highlanders scared the wits out of their opponents. It was over 50 years before the Jacobites were finally outgunned. On the 16th of April, 1746, they were wiped out for good at Culloden. In the aftermath, clans were broken up. Those caught wearing tartan or speaking Scots Gaelic faced imprisonment or even transportation overseas. The Highlands' way of life was brutally suppressed by the British government. So I find it extraordinary that less than 100 years after Culloden, the British Queen herself sauntered through here on holiday. We get a real good sense of how Victoria felt and thought when she was up in the Highlands, because she was a big diarist. Now, a lot of her diaries were burned on her death, but nevertheless, her fifth daughter, Beatrice, edited a lot of them and got them published. Of course, being typical Victorian, she edited out the juicy bits. But nevertheless, you, you do get a real feeling of her mum. For instance, this cracking view. Albert and Victoria were here and they were gawping at it. And Victoria wrote, you look down a great height, all wooded on both sides, the Gary rolling below it. I cannot describe how beautiful it is. Albert is in perfect ecstasies. They were a sweet couple, weren't they? OK, I understand why Victoria and Albert fell for the stunning scenery once they were up here. But what persuaded them to come in the first place? In search of some answers, I've come to the Athol Estate, which hosted their visit in September 1844. At the walker's back gate into the gardens, I've met up with historian Kate Williams. The fact they came was all thanks to one man, really, and that man was Sir Walter Scott. He was a massive bestseller in 19th century Britain, and he was really responsible for creating this notion of the romantic Scotland. 
Victoria loved Sir Walter Scott. She had a very unhappy childhood. Her mother was rather cruel to her, so she escaped into his fantasy world. And Albert was also a big fan of this romance. And so they really were looking for the Scotland of Sir Walter. Walter Scott had already lured one monarch to lowland Scotland. In 1822, George IV arrived in Edinburgh wearing a lurid kilt designed by Scott. The once illegal dress of the clans was transformed into high fashion. But George went to genteel Edinburgh. Albert and Victoria were heading much further north, and for three whole weeks. He had sold the visit as a holiday for his queen. But Albert had his own reasons for escaping Windsor. He wasn't actually very popular initially. She was. She was. Everyone thought she was great, and it was great that she got married. But they thought he was a, a bit of a gold digger. And one of the rhymes about him was, here comes Albert for better or worse, for England's fat queen and even fatter purse. So Ouch. Not, yeah, but not very complimentary. Do you think he also felt that he might be able to do something up here tangible that he, he couldn't do when he was surrounded by the court? Albert certainly felt that when the court was there, he couldn't get influence over his wife. She, he knew she adored him, but when the court was there, he said no, they wouldn't let him have any kind of political say. So he thought that if we come somewhere far away from London, I might be able to get a bit of that influence that I'm really fighting for. And as soon as he got here, he said, look, this looks just like Germany. It's Coburg. So he felt right at home. This isn't a hotel, is it? <laughs> look at this for a Highland Castle. They were invited to Blair Castle by the sixth Duke of Athol. An old Etonian who spent the summer seasons in London, he turned this into the region's premier hunting estate. Hello, Jane. Hi. The castle's still owned by the same family, although nowadays it opens its doors to the public every summer. Archivist Jane Anderson is going to show us some rather special first-hand evidence from the visit, which even Kate has never seen before. To start with, we have the letter that was written with Prince Albert desiring to ask whether you thought Her Majesty could have the use of Blair. It's quite striking, isn't it? There's private underlined as many times as you can at the top. <laughs> you know what strikes me most? is the first sentence of that letter there. It says, Prince Albert desired the Duke to ask me whether I thought you'd let Her Majesty have the, yes. have the house. Prince Albert. So it was him who was driving it. Oh, yeah. Charge. And almost immediately they go into kind of what they'd like. Pages, storekeepers, ladies' maids, Piper. Well, that was just the start, though, because when they actually arrived, her Majesty arrived at Blair Castle. Oh, so this is the visitor's book. This is the this visitor's is book. Her Majesty arrived at Blair Castle. Incredible. There's a pastry cook, a confectioner, a roasting cook, an upholsterer, three policemen. Yeah. So you think you had the space for them here? Well, they fitted them in somehow, but the family <laughs> had to move out. <laughs> the Duke and Duchess moved out to make room for 75 royal servants and an immense amount of baggage, which even included a grand piano. The royals insisted it was a strictly private holiday, so there are no pictures of the Queen at Blair. But this extraordinary photo shows the Duke's private bodyguard, the Athol Highlanders, ready to receive their guests on September the 11th, 1844. The regiment acted as Victoria's protection during the visit. Impressed, she gave them their royal colours, which they retain to this day. Over here, through these trees, is Old Blair, where the Duke and Duchess moved their entire family during the visits to allow the royals and their servants and their grand piano to have a bit more room. So much for not wanting to make a fuss. But never mind Blair Castle. The whole of Scotland would never be the same again after this visit. Today, I want to find out just what Victoria and Albert got up to during their first ever Highland holiday in September 1844. Following in the footsteps of their three-week adventure will take me deep into the Athol estate and the wilds of Glen Tilt. From there, I'm on a mammoth trek northeastwards through the Cairngorms and a dark period of history to reach Deeside. 
Walkers do well out here. Since 2003, Scotland's Right to Roam Act has given far greater access than in England and Wales. You're allowed to walk almost anywhere, as long as you don't upset the wildlife or the landowners. I'll show you where I am now. I am around about here somewhere. And by mid-afternoon, I've got to get all the way up there, right to the other end of Glen Tilt. And all this time, I'll be on Blair Athol land. The big landowners around here don't mess around with tiny little estates like their English counterparts. These guys own whole mountain ranges. Despite covering over 220 square miles, the Athol estate is well under half the size it was when Victoria and Albert visited, but it's still one of Scotland's great hunting estates, with over 7,000 deer roaming these glens. Albert loved nature most of all when he was shooting at it. Almost every day, he and his besotted queen came down this track like Pooh and Piglet in search of adventure. Around here somewhere there should be a spring, and on one of her excursions, Queen Victoria stopped at this spring and took a drink. Yeah, look, here it is, just here. And uh, yeah, look, there's a like a natural bowl in here. She um, took a swig and she declared it was the best water she'd ever tasted. It is pretty good. And she told her servants that from now on, all the water that she drank throughout the entire holiday had to come from that spring. I wonder if they did that. If I'd been there, I'd have got the water from the pump round the back of the castle and just told her that it came from there. I've got a long way to go today, so I'm getting some help. Hi, Debbie. Hi there. Hi, Tony. Hi, Sandy. You're going to give me a lift? I'm going mountaineering the way Victoria did it, and that means riding side saddle. Swing your right leg over the back, oh, right over. Oh, come on, come on. Good there girl. I go. Yeah. So, will we give it a go? Whoa, it does feel a bit wobbly. <laughs> Debbie McLaughlin, who runs the estate's trekking centre, and retired headkeeper Sandy Reid, are taking me away from the river tilt and up this pretty daunting track. Victoria's diary tells us that she and Albert came this way on their most adventurous expedition in 1844. Sandy, why do you think that Victoria agreed to be led when she was apparently such a good horsewoman? Well, I think she just like a bit of wee bit of eye candy, you see. A nice laddie. Go on. Victoria fell in love with the sure-footed Highland ponies. They were a practical way for a queen to conquer the Highlands and would become a feature of all future Scottish expeditions. Uh, that's boys. Oh, Oi. well done. Oh, fantastic oh, view, oh, isn't this? Wow. When they got up here, the Queen cracked out a picnic and Albert seized his chance to stalk some deer before sundown. Was he any good? Because uh, Victoria says he didn't manage to bag anything. <laughs> According to Peter Fraser, he was the head stalker. Albert was the best shot and stalker he'd ever had out. But I think he was just telling a wee porky pie. <laughs> I think Albert was a very poor shot. <laughs> but uh, it paid off for Peter in the long run. He got a tip from Albert of 50 pounds. Oh, that would have been worth a huge sum, wouldn't it? Would have it? been thousands of pounds yeah. now. It paid off to flannel him a wee bit. <laughs> The holiday here established daily rituals. The picnics, pony outings, Albert's hit and miss deer stalking, all ideas they would take with them in a few years' time to Balmoral. Thank you very much. Right, Your Majesty. Bye. Cool. We can finish our piece. <laughs> this is where I leave the 1844 holiday on the Athol estate. But I'm still following in the royal footsteps. They would travel through the natural corridor of Glen Tilt after they'd bought their own slice of the highlands over in Deeside. For thousands of years, this has been a main route for crossing the Cairngorms. Anyone passing through should pause at this kink in the River Tilt to pay a debt to a world-changing discovery. Yeah, you can see, look, there's pink granite over there, there's grey sandstone over here. 
two types of rock cross paths here, but what's fascinating is where they quite literally meet in the middle. They're all mixed in together. Can you see pink and grey? At this very spot, geologist James Hutton worked out that pink granite was injected in a molten state into far older rocks. This gave him the proof he was searching for, that the Earth is millions of years older than the Bible teaches. Heretical stuff indeed. Prince Albert was no radical thinker, but he was obsessed by science. I reckon it would have given him a thrill when, 60 years after Hutton's breakthrough, he and the Queen passed through this remotest of glens. Their servants had to wet their sporrans crossing the icy waters at the Falls of Tarf. The Duke of Athol had pulled down the only footbridge to discourage people from entering his deer park. In fact, this bridge wasn't built until after a young guy called Francis Bedford had been drowned while trying to swim across here in the year 1879. Isn't it tragic that it takes an accident like that before access is provided to allow people to cross safely? Two miles more damp slog, and I finally get off the Duke of Athol's land and straight onto another massive hunting estate, Mar Lodge. I should be feeling triumphant, but I've run into the nemesis of any Scottish walker they come out in summer, they love wet weather, and the little blighters bite. Not a bad hike, this, although the midges, I don't know if you can see them, but they're crazy, crazy, crazy. The landscape's changed a bit, but it's really broadening out here. When Albert and Victoria got this far, uh, they celebrated with a wee dram, and not because I want it, of course, but in the interest of historical reenactment, I'm going to do the same thing. Might numb the midge bites a bit too. In the 19th century, all this was the hunting ground of the Dukes of Fife. Nowadays, it belongs to the National Trust for Scotland. But over half the country is still owned by fewer than 500 people. The eerie emptiness so appealing to Albert and Victoria remains this landscape's most striking feature. Oh, good day, Tony. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. I've met up with historian Eric Richards. Eric, I don't think I've seen an emptier landscape in the whole of the United Kingdom. It's like a great wilderness, isn't it? Yeah. And it must be one of the least populated parts of Western Europe, I suspect. Why is that? Well, it used to support independent communities of, of peasant-like townships here uh, over many centuries, many generations. But in the 18th century, wool prices and sheep prices soared, and the peasant farmers were incompatible with the sheep, and they were shifted off. I can't see any sheep at all here now, though. No, well, the sheep uh, also went the way of, uh, of the people because in the 1820s and 1830s, uh, sheep prices, wool prices uh, fell, and at that time, the value of the estates as sporting estates rose very rapidly indeed. The often brutal eviction of families was most intense further north and west of here. This area was never as heavily populated, but it didn't escape. 200 years ago, several townships dotted the estate. All that's left today are a few piles of stones. So by the time Victoria and Albert came here, this would have been an artificially cleared landscape? Indeed. The, the, the place was ready for a, to become a playground of the, of the wealthy. Would Victoria and Albert have been aware of what had gone they on. must have been aware because it was heavily publicised even in the mid 19th century and particularly thereafter. The story of the clearances becomes a high drama. But the Victoria and Albert, of course, give great glamour to the whole business of sporting estates. When you look at this wonderful landscape and then you look down and you see the remnants of houses that people were forced to leave, it does put a slightly different edge on it, doesn't it? It certainly does. While the defeat of the Jacobites suppressed Highland life, the clearances actually removed it. Families dispersed around the globe. If they were lucky, those who stayed got jobs on the great sporting estates which had taken over the glens. 
It's hard to tell what Albert and Victoria thought about this political hot potato, if indeed they thought anything at all. The clearances aren't mentioned in the Queen's Highland journals. As I join the River Dee, I'm just over 20 miles from Blair Castle. But the famous Lynn of Dee is a sign I'm finally getting close to my bed for the night. That's not bad, is it? The bridge was opened by none other than Victoria. Thanks to her and Albert, this whole area has become known as Royal Deeside. And from now on, all roads lead to Balmoral. It's day three of my trek across the Cairngorms, and I've made it into Deeside. Today I want to find out just how royal it's become, thanks to Albert and Victoria. First I'll cross the Dee into Braemar, the town that each year becomes the beating heart of Brand Scotland. Then it's on to Deeside's centrepiece and Albert's brainchild, Balmoral. This Walker's Hostel is in the old stables of Mar Lodge, once the Duke of Fife's great hunting haunt. His lodge is now holiday lets, but in its heyday, Victoria popped over regularly and would have known its famous ballroom. This is a bizarre looking building, isn't it? It's like the biggest garden shed in the world. And you know, the old Duke had the whole thing painstakingly lifted up and rebuilt here when the old lodge burnt down, and all because it was in here that he kept his prized collection. Ah! <laughs> A life's work. The Duke's macabre collection totals 2,435 pairs of antlers. I'll bet Albert would have been envious of that lot. You can imagine a whole lot of medicine men casting a spell here, can't you? Not lords and ladies in their tails and tiaras dancing round. What a place! It's hard to find a square foot of Deeside that hasn't been Victorianised. Three miles to the east, that's especially true of the small town of Braemar. One weekend every September, Victoria's great-great-granddaughter attends the Braemar Gathering, the most famous Highland Games of them all. To get a taste, I'm dropping in on heavyweight champion Craig Sinclair during a training session. Hey, Craig! <laughs> I could have died. <laughs> could have. <laughs> do you do the caber as well? Yes, I do. <laughs> That's the one I want to see. I don't want that no. sticking out of me. No, you're fine. <laughs> this is an official Braemar caber, 20 foot long and weighing in at 121 pounds. It's going to be all right. You'll be fine. You're perfectly safe. It's news to me that tossing the thing isn't about distance, hey. but accuracy. It has to flip through 180 degrees and land as close to 12 o'clock as possible. Whoa! That wasn't bad, Craig. Not quite 12 o'clock. Legend has it, caber tossing was invented by Highland armies who used trees to ford rivers. And we know local games were a feature of clan life for at least seven centuries before being outlawed by the British. They were reborn in the first half of the 19th century, with the great landowners calling the shots. In came bright tartans and a sense of respectability, as workers competed for cash prizes and the honour of their estates. But it was Victoria's attendance from 1848 onwards that really rocketed the games into the global showcase of all things Scottish. Despite all the pomp, the sport itself remains the preserve of locals like Craig. Is it a professional thing? 
No, it's not. It's um, a hobby, it's an interest. A lot of guys, blue collar like myself, joiners, builders, that kind of guys that get into it, just as a way of leaving their problems outside the ring. Because at school, I didn't do any sports. But as you get older, you get wiser. And I loved it, loved the whole idea of um, putting a kilt on and just having fun. Stay strong, stay fit. Oh, well, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> From Braemar, it's a four-mile hike before I finally get close to royal land. As I've learned, Highland estates are massive, so I've still got a serious schlep to go before I'll reach Balmoral Castle itself. But there's already plenty of evidence of just how far the royal family has reshaped this landscape. This is the old bridge that goes over the River Dee, the Brigadee. Uh, and that's the A93 there that would take you back into Braemar. But have a look at this map. That's a bridge I'm standing on. And originally, the Braemar Road went all the way through there, through the Balmoral Estate. But when Victoria and Albert took it over, they didn't want loads of pedestrians and horses going through their land. So they rerouted this road all the way round here. That's the kind of thing you can do if you're royalty. And it gave them this beautiful, romantic wilderness, but it also gave us walkers a pretty little bridge we can get all dewy-eyed about. I've finally made it to the gates of Balmoral, yes. although not the entrance we normally see on the telly. This is the walkers' route in. To make sure I don't get lost on my way to the castle, head ranger Glyn Jones is escorting me. I didn't have any problems getting past the gatehouse. Can anybody come here? No, yes, yeah, absolutely. There's uh, a lot of various access points on the estate. We get about 180,000 uh, walkers uh, coming onto the estate every year. Glyn's taking me through the Ballock Bewey. It's one of the largest surviving remnants of ancient Caledonian pine forest and was a favourite haunt of Albert and Victoria after they'd bagged Balmoral. So if we uh, look, just look down the glen here, Tony, you can see uh, the first sort of view of the castle. Can you see the green fields? Yeah, because it's like a little grey tower sticking up so, there. Yeah. You get a real impression of the size of this estate from that, don't you? How big is it? It's 50,000 acres today. Uh, the original estate purchased by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert was 11,000 acres in size. How did they decide to buy it? Well, they'd looked at uh, other properties in Scotland, in particular, they, they'd visited uh, Adveriki near Loch Lagan. Um, but during their visit, I think the weather was pretty poor and they complained about the midges. The climate is very cold and dry here. Prince Albert had some issues with his health sure. and their physician, James Clark, had recommended this place to them that it was coming uh, for sale. <laughs> For four years since their stay at Blair Castle, the couple had been musing about a retreat up here. This slice of the Highlands cost them £30,000, or about £2.8 in today's money. Albert's health had long been a worry. Plagued by rheumatism, his self-imposed workload didn't help. For the best part of a decade, he'd been heavily involved in building the new Houses of Parliament, while also assuming the role of the Queen's unofficial advisor. And he was perpetually exhausted. Perhaps the bracing air of Balmoral would be the panacea he needed. Victoria had her own reasons for, as she put it, wanting to forget the world and its sad turmoils. This was 1848, the year of revolution. Political unrest exploded across more than 50 countries as great swathes united against the status quo. Denmark's absolute monarchy fell and tens of thousands died. The fervour burnt out within the year, but from now on, Victoria lived in constant fear of revolt on British soil. She needed somewhere she could feel safe. There it is, Balmoral Castle. But this is about as close as I'm going to be allowed to get because in a few days the present owner is bringing her corgis up here for their summer holiday. 
The Queen still comes up here every year for a private holiday at the end of the London season. It's where she sat to watch the results of the Scottish referendum, no doubt wondering if she would still be Queen of the United Kingdom come the morning. But this isn't the castle the royals bought in 1848. When Victoria first laid eyes on old Balmoral, she declared it a very pretty little castle in the old Scottish style. Trouble was, only a few months earlier, child number six had arrived. And as Victoria showed no signs of stopping there, it was time for Albert to roll up his sleeves. He decided he wanted to improve it in true 19th century fashion by knocking it down. His idea was to make it look more Scottish and more baronial than the previous castle, which of course was Scottish and baronial. Work began in 1852. Four years later, the new castle stood as Albert's love letter to the Highlands. A Scottish Disneyland furnished everywhere with clashing tartans, all designed by the prince himself. Victoria wrote that Albert's creation was perfection in every way. They celebrated by borrowing another local tradition and erected the first of many memorial cairns. This one's on top of Craig Gowan. Look at that view. You do realise that's someone's back garden. As the cairn was finished, the royals parted up here with pipers, whiskey and dances. See that? 1852. That's the year the cairn was built. And, of course, Victoria was watching adoringly as her husband put the last stone on top of it. And in her diary, she wrote something about that day, which I think was rather touching. She wrote, I felt almost inclined to cry. May God bless this place and allow us yet to see it and enjoy it many a long year. Well, the royal family certainly blessed this place because they've been coming here like clockwork ever since. Although for Victoria herself, the enjoyment would be short-lived. I'm starting the final leg of my walk from the tiny village of Crathy, just outside the entrance to Balmoral. For over 160 years, this has been the royals' most private retreat. Their highland fortress where they can bolt the gates against the baying mob. Over there are the front gates. This is where the journos hang out every August to try and find out who the Queen's invited on holiday and if there are any more royal scandals. The lifestyle of the royals here has hardly changed since Albert built the place. Today, I want to find out how he and Queen Victoria left their mark on the Highlands and how deeply the Highlands changed them. I'll be walking south through the Royal Playground to the dark waters of Loch Mick, scene of shared pleasures and lasting grief. By the 1850s, the royal duo had become much more adventurous than a decade earlier on the Athol estate. They even conquered Mount Loch Nagar several times. At 3,789 feet, it's the headline feature of the estate. I've tried, I really have tried, but I can't imagine Queen Victoria mountaineering up there, can you? Not in those long skirts. She says she did. She said she walked for four hours or more a day. And she certainly had a lot of energy, but come on. I reckon it was her trusty Highland ponies that did most of the work, don't you? Victoria and Albert enjoyed acting as they saw it, like the numerous Highlanders who now worked for them. They even started disguising themselves as locals and staying in nearby inns, although I doubt they fooled anyone. To find out more about the world they created here... Hi, Tony. <laughs> I've stopped by one of Victoria's picnic spots to meet author and historian Helen Rappaport. 
They actually took great pleasure in the simple Scottish life, you know, visiting cottages and eating porridge and pancakes and doing the Scottish thing. It was such a release from all the hidebound protocols of court life, all the ceremonial and shaking hands and cutting ribbons. Here they could be as free as any monarch possibly ever could be free. In Albert's case particularly, he would spend the day doing nothing in particular. And for a man so driven, this was an, a wonderful antidote to overwork. By this time, Albert had pulled off the great exhibition, his 1851 showcase of Britain's engineering and artistic might at Crystal Palace. He'd also sealed his position as Victoria's most trusted advisor. But as his political influence grew, he reawakened old enemies in the press. His opposition to the Crimean War of 1853 even led to accusations he was a Russian sympathiser. For two months each year, Balmoral was Albert and Victoria's sanctuary. They had their own little Scottish fantasy, and part of that was affecting Scottish mannerisms. Even the Queen at times when she was up here would put on a slight Scots accent. <laughs> Albert tried to learn Gaelic and didn't do very well at it. I think the fact that they spend so much time here must have meant a lot to the local people. Financially, it must have, must not it? I'm stuck. <laughs> <On a hand. laughs> there we are. <laughs> I missed yeah, my foot there. It must have been quite a, f a positive financial impact on the local people of having them up here all oh, the time. Well, it created the Scottish Highland tourist trade. Once the Queen started coming regularly to Scotland, Scotland became hugely fashionable. Thomas Cook started running tours here. Eight miles south of the castle, Helen's brought me to the eight-bedroomed cottage Victorian nicknamed the Hut. Nowadays, it's let out to holiday makers, but in the 1850s, the royal couple camped out here regularly. Is that a little corridor between the love yes. nest and the servants? Yes, they built that so that they could go back and forth without getting soaked when the weather was terrible. The equerries and ladies-in-waiting um, absolutely loathed having to come to Balmoral. They coined a phrase for it, the members of the entourage, they called it Balmorality, this kind of stultified, dreary, boring, mundane existence that they had to kowtow to. And, of course, the prime ministers um, hated having to make this great long journey here, particularly Disraeli, totally refused to come. And ironically, although the Queen's physician had recommended the side as perfect for his health and his rheumatism, it might actually have made Albert's rheumatism worse, crawling through all the heather, stalking deer. Just south of the cottage, I reach Loch Mick. It's Gaelic for Loch of the Swine, although no one seems quite sure how it got that name. Apparently, the royal couple kept a boat on this little loch. Presumably, that's the boathouse. Look, there's the track that they'd have used to launch it. It must have been quite a big boat, because according to Victoria's diary, it took four men to row it. Sandy? I'm hitching a ride down Loch Mick in a rather less regal vessel. Hi, Tony, how are you today? Oh, I Welcome. Can I come on board? Yes, of course you can. Hello. The loch's choppy, but it's, uh, it's, it's fine now. Every time they had to leave Balmoral, the royal mood darkened. In October 1861, the Queen wrote, My heart sinks within me at the prospect of going back to Windsor. Albert found it even harder. Away from here, he was increasingly depressed and weighed down by the demands of court. Most exhausting was the brood of nine children. Years later, Victoria could still not forgive eldest son Bertie for the toll his scandalous philandering took on Albert's fragile health. In December 1861, the Prince Consort was diagnosed with typhoid fever. At Windsor, the family gathered around to read to him. Victoria chose a novel by Walter Scott. But on the 14th of December, Albert died, aged 42. We all know what happened next. 
Victoria descended into decades of mourning and Balmoral became a shrine to Albert's memory. Sadly, by this time, the little cottage at the far end of the lock was too full of happy memories for Victoria, and the couple had always said they wanted to build somewhere here, so she did. This was where she came to enjoy her solitude, and she called it the Widow's House. Victoria lived the rest of her life reenacting the rituals she and Albert had created together. Balmoral was frozen in aspic. But in their 17 years of coming to the Highlands, the couple had, quite unintentionally, promoted this place to the world. While Victorian England was celebrated for its modern industry and dirty great cities, Scotland had become famous, ironically, for its Highland traditions. I've never been much of a fan for tartan and shortbread and all that Scottish flummery. It's too manufactured and historically shaky for me. But one thing I have learned on my walk is this. Because Victoria and Albert came here, because they stayed here, because they were besotted by the place, and because in their own minds at least they reinvented it, it completely altered the relationship between their English subjects and Scotland. Scotland was no longer a dangerous place, a threatening place, a place brimming with insurrection. Now it was beautiful, it was romantic, somewhere to come on your holidays. Albert and Victoria really love Scotland, and like countless Englishmen since then, so do I. If you want to follow in my footsteps, you can download a guide to my walk by going to www.channel4.com. And Tony's in Wales for the Norman Conquest of Pembrokeshire, walking through history next Saturday at 8. Arthur Williams explores the two million British soldiers who sustained life-changing injuries in the Great War. World War I's Forgotten Heroes, tomorrow at 7. Next tonight, from America's best assets to America's most wanted, as Bruce Willis and Helen Mirren star in red. My walks take me to every corner of Britain as I seek out history embedded in the landscape. In this country, you're never very far from mysterious ruins or the shadow of unwelcome visitors. So from romantic moors to majestic peaks, I'm really enjoying some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me through a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time I'm in the Scottish Highlands, where tourists flock for tartan traditions and spectacular scenery. But until the 19th century, outsiders like me would have avoided this area, a mysterious and dangerous land populated by barbarians in kilts. I want to discover how all that changed, thanks to an unpopular German prince and his besotted queen. The Cairngorms National Park is Britain's largest parkland. Ancient native forests, vast lochs, and our highest mountain range, all stretching across 1,700 square miles of the highlands. Pitlochry is the southern gateway to the region, and its high street screams Scotland from every window. There's kilts and plaids and bagpipes and cute little tea rooms. No wonder the tourists flock here, but it is McDisneyland. Where do these clichés come from? Is this really Scottish or all just for the tourists? At a time when Britain's 300-year union and Scotland's identity are being debated and reshaped, I want to explore the creation of the world-famous Scottish brand. Look at all those turrets and crenellations. It does a pretty good impersonation of a castle, doesn't it? But do you think it's seen many marauding Scots and bits of flying shrapnel? No. Not bad for a hotel, though. 
and he was really responsible for creating this notion of the romantic Scotland. Victoria loved Sir Walter Scott. She had a very unhappy childhood. Her mother was rather cruel to her, so she escaped into his fantasy world, and Albert was also a big fan of this romance, and so they really were looking for the Scotland of Sir Walter. Walter Scott had already lured one monarch to lowland Scotland. In 1822, George IV arrived in Edinburgh wearing a lurid kilt designed by Scott. The once illegal dress of the clans was transformed into high fashion. But George went to genteel Edinburgh. Albert and Victoria were heading much further north, and for three whole weeks. He had sold the visit as a holiday for his queen. But Albert had his own reasons for escaping Windsor. He wasn't actually very popular initially. She was. She was. Everyone thought she was great, and it was great that she got married. But they thought he was a, a bit of a gold digger. And one of the rhymes about him was, here comes Albert for better or worse, for England's fat queen and even fatter purse. So Ouch. Not, yeah, but not very complimentary. Do you think he also felt that he might be able to do something up here tangible that he, he couldn't do when he was surrounded by the court? Albert certainly felt that when the court was there, he couldn't get influence over his wife. She, he knew she adored him, but when the court was there, he said no, they wouldn't let him have any kind of political say. So he thought that if we come somewhere far away from London, I might be able to get a bit of that influence that I'm really fighting for. And as soon as he got it, he said, look, this looks just like Germany. It's Coburg. So he felt right at home. This isn't a hotel, is it? <laughs> Look at this for a Highland Castle. They were invited to Blair Castle by the 6th Duke of Athol. An old Etonian who spent the summer seasons in London, he'd turned this into the region's premier hunting estate. Hello, Jane. Hi. The castle's still owned by the same family, although nowadays it opens its doors to the public every summer. Archivist Jane Anderson is going to show us some rather special first-hand evidence from the visit, which even Kate has never seen before. To start with, we have the letter that was written with Prince Albert. Dis Pitlochry is part of the wholesale 19th century rebranding which brought tourists flooding to the Highlands. It's a transformation that owes a surprising debt to the couple at the centre of my four-day walk. Prince Albert and Queen Victoria. I'll be crossing three giant sporting estates the royal pair knew well. Day one takes me through the Killycranky Pass, a battlefield of rebellious pre-Victorian Scotland. Then it's on to an unprecedented royal visit at Blair Castle. Day two is an epic hike over the Cairngorms, I'll discover how brutal clearances made this one of the emptiest landscapes in Europe and a playground for the rich. Into Royal D side, I get a taste for the Highland Games at Braemar, before reaching the Tartan Palace Albert built for his queen at Balmoral. On my final day, I'll explore the murky waters of Loch Mick and the legacy this couple's passion has left in the landscape. I'm setting off north of Pitlochry, along the banks of the River Garry, through the Killycranky Pass. I'm already in the footsteps of Albert and Victoria. On the 11th of September 1844, they disembarked the royal yacht at Dundee and travelled through here on their first ever visit to the Highlands. They'd had a busy four years of marriage. 25-year-old Victoria had given birth to her fourth child only a month before. She'd also survived three assassination attempts. Albert demanded she take a holiday. But coming here was an extraordinary move, because no British monarch had ever travelled this far north. In fact, less than a century earlier, the British state was still at war with the Highlands, a bloody conflict that lasted over 50 years and started right here with the very first Jacobite uprising. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. To find out what happened here at Killycranky, I've asked historian Alistair Moffat to join me on the old military road through the pass. 
This was a very important route because this took you from the lowlands, lowland pressure, into the highlands. I mean, we're crossing Britain's last frontier, really. People spoke Scots, English. Behind us, in front of us, they spoke Gaelic. So was this Jacobite country? Oh, yes. I mean, this was clan country. The Jacobites were led by Viscount Dundee, known as Bonnie Dundee. You had to be Bonnie <laughs> to be a Jacobite leader. Bonnie Dundee was the first man to raise an army against the British government in support of the ousted Catholic king, James VII. On the 27th of July, 1689, Dundee's Highlanders massed just north of this pass. This was an absolutely strategic flashpoint. This was the way into the Highlands, but it was also dangerously the way out. 5,000 highly organised government troops, twice the Highlanders' numbers, marched through the narrow pass. Bonnie Dundee's men were ready for them. Raising their broadswords, they charged, cutting right through the terrified British army. We're standing above uh, the soldier's leap where Donald McBain, who is a fleeing government soldier, he's running for his life and he's running down here and he's been pursued by half a dozen hairy arsed Highlanders. <laughs> I tell you, he gets to the River Gary here and he jumps it. He jumps clear across. He sets a world record for the long <laughs> jump. And I tell you, if it was me, I'd set one as well. The Highlanders won a stunning victory at Killycranky and an indelible reputation as barbarous warriors, helped perhaps by their unique dress sense. I'm almost embarrassed to ask you this question. Yeah. Well, I am embarrassed, because it's the real <laughs> callow Englishman's question. Did they really wear kilts on the battlefield? Yes, they did, but not as you and I would know it. Um, they wore what was called the big kilt, which essentially was just a huge plaid uh, secured by a belt, and they pulled it around their middle, and, of course, I have one here. Of course you do. I have one here. Now, this is basically a huge rug. That's it's essentially what it is. It's and if you massive. chuck it out, you'll see it is absolutely enormous. How the heck would you fight in this? Well, you didn't. I mean, basically, they unbuckled their belts and they threw these away and they charged in their sarks or their shirts. They didn't wear pants? Uh, no. No, no. Such a thing was never known in the Highlands. It really was that. Oh, yeah. Whoa. yeah, exactly. That's right. You know, show your backside to the enemy, then turn around and give them what for. I'm not surprised the Highlanders scared the wits out of their opponents. It was over 50 years before the Jacobites were finally outgunned. On the 16th of April, 1746, they were wiped out for good at Culloden. In the aftermath, clans were broken up. Those caught wearing tartan or speaking Scots Gaelic faced imprisonment or even transportation overseas. The Highlands' way of life was brutally suppressed by the British government. So I find it extraordinary that less than 100 years after Culloden, the British Queen herself sauntered through here on holiday. We get a real good sense of how Victoria felt and thought when she was up in the Highlands, because she was a big diarist. Now, a lot of her diaries were burned on her death, but nevertheless, her fifth daughter, Beatrice, edited a lot of them and got them published. Of course, being typical Victorian, she edited out the juicy bits. But nevertheless, you, you do get a real feeling of her mum. For instance, this cracking view. Albert and Victoria were here and they were gawping at it. And Victoria wrote, you look down a great height, all wooded on both sides, the Gary rolling below it. I cannot describe how beautiful it is. Albert is in perfect ecstasies. They were a sweet couple, weren't they? OK, I understand why Victoria and Albert fell for the stunning scenery once they were up here. But what persuaded them to come in the first place? In search of some answers, I've come to the Athol Estate, which hosted their visit in September 1844. At the walker's back gate into the gardens, I've met up with historian Kate Williams. The fact they came was all thanks to one man, really, and that man was Sir Walter Scott. He was a massive bestseller in 19th century Britain.